Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of Adobe Live. My name is James Bonanno, and I am joined by the very talented Justin Bettman. Justin, welcome to uh, day two, man. Thank you. Stoked to be here. This should be fun. Yeah, stoked to uh, have Justin here as a part of our day two of his conceptual photography uh, stream. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Robert. Welcome, Emma, Ferry, Andreas. Man, we got a, we got a gang of people in here, and uh, we're super excited to kick things off. Um, for those that are new to this uh, kind of format, uh, if you are watching right now, uh, you are on behance.net slash Adobe Live. Uh, if you miss this stream and you want to head over to a replay, uh, head over to the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud YouTube channel where you can watch day one of Justin's stream uh, to kind of catch up with where we're at. Uh, that being said, Justin, maybe just a, a quick little intro to who you are. I know a lot of people got that yesterday, but for those that are new to the stream today, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you, and as you can see, your work uh, is kind of you know just speaking for itself. So uh, take it away, man. Yeah, my name is Justin. I am a conceptual photographer, and so I like to uh, create <clears throat> stories and narratives in my photographs. And today we're going to be retouching an image that was a staged photograph, but is meant to look like a captured moment of a scene of um, some cool kids from the '70s. So yeah, so we'll. Uh, jump right in so oh, yeah, here absolutely. is the uh here's the original plate that i shot and as you'll see it doesn't look too bad straight out of camera but i don't think we want uh a soft box in the shot and the reason i i put that there was because i wanted <laughs> it to feel like a motivated light source for a tv which i then later shot mm -hmm. um so you'll see that tv plate there and so that's uh one of the main things that we're going to be focusing on is how to switch that a light out to make it a TV and make it feel real. And then, uh, yeah, doing some other cleanup. This was actually a set. This is not a real location. Oh yeah. Friend, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. My friend, Sean Patrick built it. So, um, you can see here at the top, the wood doesn't quite meet where the fake ceiling is. So we'll want to clean some of that stuff up, just general cleanup. And then, because there are motivated light sources in the shot, like this lamp has warmth coming off of it, but this TV is cool and there's a little bit of warmth over here. We'll play with a little bit of color too and, cool. and figure out how we wanna do that. So right on, yeah, man. let's jump right in. Sweet, yeah, and for those uh, for those tuning in, uh, welcome Voodoo Val. It's always a pleasure to have you in the chat. Um, yesterday, again, uh, if you guys wanna go uh, take a look at the stream that we had yesterday, uh, really like an awesome conversation and some retouching with uh, a really cool holiday card that Justin and his fiance made. Um, and today a completely different style, which, which I'm stoked for. And Sean Patrick, kudos on the, the set design, man. I feel like I'm in my, my grandpa's hunting cabin. Totally. Yeah. It's coming for almost like a basement feeling. Very the guy much. on the left is on the phone, maybe in an argument with his girlfriend. The <laughs> other two guys are just, you know, hanging out, having a good time, talking about their favorite, uh, favorite album, that, that sort of thing. So, um, before yeah. you get, before you get started, Justin, we have a question in the chat from Ferry. Um, he wants to know if you have any tips on photo stacking. Um, as far for focusing or I, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume, um, maybe speak to both of them. I think obviously there's like different use cases for that, but Ferry, are you referring to focusing or, or stat, you know, stacking for compositing um well i'll jump into compositing because that's more my sure my background um for compositing i would say that the important thing is to shoot on a tripod and if you can shoot tethered you can do it in lightroom and there's also other software you can do it um then you're not even touching your camera each time so there's no ability for there to be a little bit of motion shake or anything like that so yeah having it locked off on a tripod and throwing some sandbags on there is the best way to do it. And then 
you'll see for this situation, it's not super, super easy, but it's not impossible or that difficult to throw our TV in here and make it really feel like that was what was glowing and creating this, uh, you know, contrasting color temperature in the scene. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, great question. And, uh, and one other question for you and we'll, uh, we'll hop in there, but, yeah. um, Travis has a question about lighting. Um, and I was actually curious, do you in shooting medium format, like you had said yesterday, do you use a light meter at all? Or are you just basically going off of the digital camera settings that you're, you're using on your camera? So I always shoot tethered, like I was mentioning before for shooting plates. So <clears throat> I'm always looking at the computer screen. And almost every shoot that I do, I do it this way, that I'm shooting with a, either a laptop or something similar where I can see in real time, take a picture and look on a bigger screen and say, hey, how does this look? And sometimes I'll even have a bigger monitor, you know, if I want to see what it looks like at 27 inches, um, hook up an extra monitor and then you can really see each detail. For my shots, I want it to look good if you printed it six feet wide. And so being able to just look at the back of a screen isn't quite enough for me. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's a good safe measure too. I find that, you know, for video and photos and especially in the format of photography you're creating, like being able to see it on the size that you want that finished product will save you a lot of time too in the retouching process. And if you forgot like a cord, like you did yesterday, like a lot of that stuff can actually be fixed if you see it on a, a larger monitor. Totally. That being said, um, a lot of my photo assistants do use light meters and I think they are super valuable. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. I don't think that's a lost art form yet. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Not yet. And it's, yeah. it's making a comeback. I mean, film photography and film in general is just, I feel like it's been on the come up again for a while. So the use of light meters is, is definitely not dead. Um, awesome. Perfect. Well, cool. we'll, uh, keep on, on cruising with this. So I think the first thing I want to do before I do like general cleanup is focus on getting that TV in there. So I think it'll be a big part of compositing this together. So the first thing you want to do is throw in that uh, second layer and try and line it up as best you can. So one method for this is putting it on a difference layer. I didn't do this yesterday, but if you put it at 100% on difference, you can kind of see where thing, if it perfectly lines up, then you almost shouldn't see anything in some of these details like the wood. And now the area that we care the most about it lining up is over where the TV will be. So let's see if I need to move it a pixel or two over. Do you see how it's getting darker and now it's mm. perfectly dark? Yeah, yeah. Right about, and the line that I'm looking at that's important, this is where we started, is right below the deer and above the TV because this piece of wood and this scene needs to line up. So boom, there's nothing there. So now mm. we know that lines up right there. Um, and you can see the tripod moved a little bit um, and maybe it's actually the focal length that changed because if I move it right, the stuff on the left side over here, um, is showing. And if you move it to the left, a couple pixels, then over on the right, that's happening. So I care more about it matching over here on the right near the TV. Gotcha. So we'll do that and we'll change the blending mode back to normal, have it at 100%. And what I like to do first is just kind of eyeball and see, Hey, is this going to even work? Um, and we're going to duplicate our bottom layer because I never like to work off of that. So we'll just call this background. Um, and then here we go. We'll invert that. And so let's just try painting it in roughly and just to see, hey, will this work before we spend too much time on it? Seems like that's blending okay. Once again, yeah. we'll want the color to match a little bit more. But just to yeah, um, get it get it placed first. To see just to get it placed and see right. if it's making sense for us. Okay. Yeah. I feel like just looking at that feels like we're not off to a bad start. So I think now it's time to, to do it properly. Um, and so in order to do that, let's see, we'll get rid of some of this. And what's going to be really important is doing a clean edge around him. So we're going to bust out the, uh, the pen tool again and try and trace this table and the album. Dude, that Pepsi can't like, I, I just keep looking at all of the props that you have in here and how, I mean, that can't be like understated at all because to, to do this right. And to have this whole mood you know every little prop you have on there from those magazines to the 35 millimeter camera to that pepsi can 
have that vintage 70s vibe. Yeah. So the place that I actually shot this where Sean owns it is called Acme Brooklyn and it's a prop house. Oh yeah. I'm um, aware of that place. But um the guys that I all shot and casted for this shoot are all very, very into like 70s and 80s style. Cool. So the <laughs> Pepsi can, if I'm not mistaken, is actually um his name's Waffle. He's the guy in the middle with the basketball. <laughs> um, I think it is Waffle's Pepsi can. And I think that a lot of these albums were also ones that some of these guys had brought. So, um, that's, so cool. that's really, really cool. Yeah. I, I honestly feel like I'm like looking into some sort of like Spike Lee, uh, like cover photo for a, for some movie that he's doing. And I mean, it's cool. It, it just, it instills a lot of different like nostalgic vintage, uh, feelings and that's cool. Like, you know, talking about your process and you, like you were going over yesterday, how, you know, props play such a important role and such a big role in creating that, that vibe and making sure that all of it feels like it just was a moment in time, you know, in that era. Totally. Yeah. And that's one reason I like working with, uh, sort of nostalgic or vintage props and that sort of thing is I feel like everyone can relate to the past. Um, and, it's interesting for me with like the seventies era because I never lived it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. I wasn't born in the seventies, but it's fun to almost imagine. And I wonder how much of it is me romanticizing it versus something that people really experienced, but yeah. Well, and um, you have a lot of, and you have a lot of inspiration and influence from, you know, other photographers and other filmmakers and just creatives who have come before us and, you know, establish their own interpretation of what the seventies was like, because they probably lived through it. So, um, I, there's a question in the chat. Um, and while you're, while you're cutting, cutting your subject out, um, it yep. would be a good time for you to maybe talk a little bit about your process. I know you hit on it yesterday, but Nicholas wants to know what your pre-production process looks like from, you know, art direction to set building, even just for, you know, shoots like this. Yeah. I mean, every shoot is kind of different. Um, the main thing that, varies is like am i shooting in an existing space that i've found or am i trying to build something that doesn't exist and i think especially when i first started out and didn't have too many friends who worked in set design or have access to a big like art department i uh it would be really really important for me to find a cool location and a lot of times that would inform a shoot hmm. and recently i actually did a shoot where, or i'm in pre-production for one where the location is really informing the shoot. So I found the end of the street, it looked really pretty during sunset <laughs> and it had a really classic looking um, all American street. And so then I was like, okay, I wanna do a shoot here. And then um, I've talked to a neighbor who lived there and he has an older car. And so I decided, okay, that's gonna be in the shot. And I kind of build the, the scene based off of the location. And then there's other shoots that I do where I'm very particular about what I want to be in the shot. And so that helps dictate, um, like then sometimes I'll do mood boards or if I'm working with a prop house, look through their catalog of what they have and have that help inform um, what I'm going to, to use for my shoot um, and kind of look through that. And then also collaborating. I like to have the motto that I like to hire people who are really good at what they do. And then I'm able to lean on them and, and listen to their feedback for what they recommend. And I find that to be really helpful as well. Yeah. So, I mean, you have, you have a lot of different ways, uh, in your pre-production that you're, you know, creating, creating the work you create. And I, I think it's really cool that, you know, like location or a prop or just inspiration from another artist or creator really drives you to create an idea. You know, like yesterday when you were going over your your banana holiday card, it seems like those poodles, uh, the two poodle lamps that you had were something that you're like, I need to get this in a shoot. How do I then build something around that? And I think that's a really uh, unique and interesting way. Um, cool part of your process for sure. Totally. And you can see right here, there's certain <coughs> areas before it was a little bit bluer because that light is actually illuminating blue. I had a blue gel in there. And now the old, the new one that we're putting in with the TV has a little bit of warmth. So I'm going over it with a really low opacity, trying to find a good balance of um, 
of blending it so that way you don't see a hard edge of where I cut out. Mm. And so let's just take a look. One thing that I'm noticing is if you look close at his beard, I didn't do something super precise because I just wanted to cut around it real quick, but you're seeing a hard edge on there. <coughs> oh, yeah. So let's go in there and just kind of paint back in what we had before. And it's okay if there's a little bit of a blue on there because we're going to add a glow to our TV. So that way that flows nicely. And now in this, in this uh, specific photo, and when you have more than, you know, one subject, which you do a lot of where you have, you know, multiple characters in one frame are, is the goal to be able to get all of them in one shot so that it just, the scene is already built. It makes the most sense. Or do you shoot different plates with different subjects in them and then kind of Photoshop them in afterwards? I do try to get it all in one shot. Sometimes it's not possible. For this one, it was possible, but um, yeah, it really just depends shoot to shoot. And on a lot of my advertising shoots, it turns out that there's more compositing on those types of shots because they're even more particular. And a lot of times you have a lot of shots you're trying to do in one day, so you're not able to workshop it and get the perfect shot in camera right. necessarily. We're just painting this in because you can see a little bit of that light stand. Once again, we'll just <laughs> go through this album. Sorry, this to those is nice because there are uh, people think okay. I'm I'm very sick. Everyone's like, "Are you okay, James? You've been coughing a lot." I'm sorry. I'm trying to move off screen, so hopefully it's not too distracting. I'm coming off of uh, of the flu, but I'm uh, it's about a week and a half in, so I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> destroying people's ears at home. That's not the goal. <laughs> so let's take a look at this so to me that's feeling pretty good yeah the one thing that's throwing me off that i was planning for well there's a couple things actually i feel like this blue light over here feels really really strong and you can tell that it's shot on cheap wood <laughs> yeah. it was um some of that like printed vinyl siding so that's bothering me a little bit um and then also the fact that there's a really strong blue glow hitting Waffle over here and hitting his face over there, but there's no blue coming off the TV. So it feels to me artificially lit. Yep. So we're going to address both of those issues. The first one, let's try tackling this where we take it down and maybe there will still be a little bit of a blue glow, but not as much. So we're just going to get soft brush, pretty low flow. Just start painting this over because remember, if we look, we'll turn off the layer mask. There was no glow on this one. Mm. So if we paint some of that over, it'll at least lower it without completely getting rid of it, which is what I'm going for. Yeah. Good to have some semblance of it. If you're, if you're looking for that, yep. is, the, is the plan or the goal to uh, pull that glow from the TV eventually as if the TV was on or is the TV just going to stay off? Nope, you're absolutely right. So the reason <laughs> I used the artificial lighting with that is, uh, and put that softbox there is so that way we can feel that glow. Cool. Um, so you're absolutely right with that. So let's pull back and see. Maybe this hard line is bothering me just a little bit. So... I love then, the uh, I love the addition of that old radiator too. Like not only because it's just a great prop in that space that you know most people wouldn't think of, but it does allow separation from the wall with the subject too. Like you, you use it as not only a prop but also a way to to add a little more contrast between you know subject and background. Totally. The other purpose for it, like you mentioned, is that it feels a lot like less like a set when you put something in there because maybe it's not visually the most flattering or pretty item, but it uh, it helps sell it as real. And a lot of times I'll also put outlets or something like that in a shot because mm -hmm. that to me is a big giveaway if something's a set or it's not. So yeah. let's look at that. All right, so we did a pretty good job of toning that down. There's still a little bit of that glow, but it's not too much. So if we think about a TV and the light source that we had before, it was a light blue and it was really illuminating and a TV, let's say that they uh, didn't get any good reception down there. So maybe we'll add static because we don't want to, we don't have a stock photo that we're planning on using or something like that. <clears throat> Though you could definitely do that if you wanted to be a, put a stock photo. So let's try 
Once again, bust out the pen tool. Faithful pen tool. Can't go wrong with it. And we're going to turn off this. If anyone knows how to, by default, when you use the pen tool, not have fill or stroke start, let me know because. Yeah, I was wondering that too, because I feel like every time I open it up, it's, if it's a shape, it's going to fill. And yeah. I'm constantly turning it on and off. So yeah, if anyone in the chat knows that. Teach me something. Please. I'd be proud. I'd be happy to learn. <laughs> We're all ears. Any other questions from uh, from the chat right now? Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Um, Ferry uh, wanted to know what camera you use. Uh, Ferry, I don't know if you were here yesterday, but just to maybe just reiterate, I know you spoke to that a little bit. Yeah, the GFX 100 by Fuji. But I would, for me personally, I would invest <laughs> more money into artificial lighting and less into a camera body. I think that if I had a $3,000 budget, which for a lot of people is a lot of money, so I don't take that lightly, but if I had $3,000, I would spend $500 on a really entry-level DSLR and $2,500 on artificial lighting. And I think you would come up with an image that's pretty similar in quality to this um, versus if you spent $3,000 on a camera body and no artificial lighting, mm -hmm. I think it would be very hard to create that. That's a that's a huge point. And, and I think like to echo that advice too, when it comes to like camera bodies and the best things to invest in to get the, the shot you want. I, I often feel like now because there's so much um, technology out there and there's constant upgrades of camera bodies and new releases by Sony and Canon and Fuji and, and Nikon and all these companies that like everyone thinks they need the next camera. And I, I feel like some of the best work that people do is when you have less and you're on more of like a shoestring budget or you're using a camera that doesn't, that limits you a little bit and you have to think outside the box and get a little more creative. Totally. <clears throat> Um, jumping back into this picture, to me, it feels like so much better, even just putting this on. Um, it really feels like that TV is actually on and there's a real motivation for that light. You know, mm. it's hitting the Pepsi can, it's hitting the table, it's hitting waffle over here, it's hitting yeah. the album cover. It really makes a big difference. But this feels pretty fake, right? It's completely bright. It's all the way on. Doesn't really feel real. So one thing is that the edge of the TV, if you look here, it's a little bit soft. It's not totally hard. So one thing that we'll do is uh, let's do select filter, or sorry, blur, Gaussian blur. And let's just put a little bit of a blur and see what it looks like if it's not totally sharp on there. Because the other mm -hmm. edges on here, it's not fully in focus. It has a little bit of fall off. And sometimes that light bleeds over the edge of the screen a little bit. So let's just put a little bit of a, a blur on there. I think that feels about right. Let's zoom out. Yeah. It's feeling th good. If you think about, you know, what TVs were like those old box set TVs, if, if you had some in grandparents' homes or, you know, your parents' house and stuff like you never, it was never a sharp edge anyway. I mean, the resolution on TVs was not nearly what it is today. And so that fall off was kind of just naturally happening anyway. So to be able to, like you spoke to yesterday, Justin, like trying to recreate the reality of what actually was in that scene, like you wouldn't see a, a sharp edge anyway. Totally. And then if we go back here, if we bring down the opacity just a little bit, you start to see this highlight on the right that naturally was occurring. So I think that's what we'll do here. <clears throat> we'll just bring down the opacity a bit and I have it on a screen blending mode. So it brightens um, the image and lightens any of the darker areas. Um, so let's see what that looks like. That's feeling pretty good to me. Yeah, I think maybe awesome. it could go even a little bit brighter. So just with curves, I'm going to brighten it a bit. That's maybe too bright. And we still want just a little bit of that blue hue. When I chose the color, I didn't want it to be pure white. I wanted it to have just a little bit of blue. So we'll do that. And then if we want it to feel like the TV's got static on it, what we can do is select that area. You can hit command and then click it. And then let's do a new layer. And we're going to um, fill it. Or, so let's put a little bit of gray in there and then we're gonna add grain to it. Mm -hmm. So choose the gray. 
There it is. Now our TV is gray. Well, we don't want it to be gray. Um, so what we're going to do, we'll put it on a soft light blending mode, which isn't really affecting the image that much because that was pretty close to a medium gray. Right. Now we're going to go to filter, noise, add noise. <laughs> and now we're starting to get a little bit of that uh, grain Ooh, on it. Yeah. That feels to me a little funky because it's color with those pixels or with that grain. And usually these TVs back then I would think would be maybe black and white, or that might be fun for our shot. So if we click monochromatic, boom, cool. it instantly becomes a, uh... and then to be honest, I don't know the difference between uniform and Gaussian for this, but I like to just try both options and kind of see what feels like it's working and we'll keep it fairly subtle. We can also do it a little heavier and then lower the opacity kind of up to you. Maybe we'll do a little bit of both. So. Once again, you always got to zoom out and see what it looks like from a little further away. And that's still feeling kind of heavy. So we'll just bring down the opacity just a little bit. Let's see how that feels. That's feeling pretty good. Yeah, so that's that what you, cool. if this is if you put static on without brightening it, which that feels about right. But then we want it to feel like it's on. And maybe we want to emphasize the blue just a little bit more. So what we can do is what we talked about yesterday to a color balance, but do a clipping mask. So create clipping mask. And then in the highlights, let's add a little cyan to it. <clears throat> a little bit of blue, maybe go even further. And we can do the same thing with the midtones. There we go. It's nice too, What's like that? the the blue and the, you know, that brightness from the TV contrast that really warm lamp too, like really yep. nicely. And so it's positioned in a way where it's not necessarily symmetrical with everything, but like it as a composition, it works. Your eyes are drawn to the right places, you know, deliberately where you want them to go. Totally. Um, so we'll go back and make sure that we're labeling everything, which I haven't been doing. So this is lightened TV. <clears throat> and then the next one is going to be grain, TV grain. And then this is color of the TV, TV screen color. And then this shape we have here, let's look at it. That was for the inside of the TV, so we can keep that there. And then this is actual TV swap. So let's put these all in a group together and let's see what we've done so far today. So that's pretty drastic. Oh yeah. Um, now I'm feeling like the light here that's still hitting feels a little milky and weird. And even though it did actually hit there when we had the softbox, it doesn't feel like it should for our shot. So I'm gonna go in and clean that up a little bit more, try and paint over it with our layer where we didn't have that and just see if I'm liking that more or if we prefer it before. And I think I like it without it. There's yeah. still a little glow behind his head, but that's starting to feel pretty good to me. Yeah, because it was almost a little too, like it was still there, but like I think you needed to pick a direction and I, I like just getting rid of it completely. For sure. So now we'll go through and that was kind of the hardest part in my opinion of this shot is, is adding that in there. So now we're going to do cleanup and then we'll do overall color for it. Cool. So the um, cleanup was... as we saw yesterday takes a while so <laughs> it definitely does well i have a couple questions in the yeah. chat here from some, let's hear it some folks so um hopefully uh we still have everyone still in the chat but uh someone wants to know what a great standalone artificial light uh you'd recommend that is less than 500 dollars. something that maybe they can get started with um, whether it's a strobe or continuous um, what are your thoughts there yeah, there, uh, there's a few different options depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, Alien Bees makes a really nice, um, pretty affordable light. Um, that's out of Nashville. Um, and yeah, I think they also have ones called Einstein's. And I think those are between three and 500 if you go Alien Bee versus, uh, versus if you go with the Einstein's. But I think those are really good options to start with. Okay. Um, if you want to go with a constant light, I've been using these lights lately called Nan lights, and they're oh, yeah. similar if you know what a Astera is. Um, but you can, they have these, I think it's called a Pavo tube, and they look almost like a, a halogen light, a, just a tube. And you can change the color temperature of it, and you can change the intensity. Um, 
And I think the ones I have are RGB, so you can choose any color. It doesn't have to be from cool to warm. And those are great if you want like a practical light source in the shot. So recently I did a shoot and there was kitchens in the shot and I wanted it to look like light was glowing. Like there was something for under the cabinets to illuminate it and really give it depth. And it worked perfect for that sort of thing. Yeah, those <clears throat> those lights are pretty incredible. And, and, and I think I've... they're a couple hundred dollars each. So you could get two of them for under 500 and you would st and you could still use those as your like a key light or a you know a rim light or something to get you started and what's cool about those is that you can use them as a practical as well like you know in a shot or just use them as a stylized way to kind of light up a light up a scene in a little bit of a more unique way totally yeah if you look at a lot of current film you'll see a lot of people do that so we'll notice here on this edge this is where the set ends <laughs> and so Let's try and extend this over a little bit. If we want to, what we can do is just highlight the area that doesn't have it, go over a couple pixels, and then use the free transform. So if you do Command T and just boop, extend over what we had. And you know why that's not working? <laughs> it's because I have this layer that we've painted on that's actually over it. Um, so if we're really, really happy with the TV, which I am, I'm going to create a new layer and merge everything below it. So the shortcut for that is command option shift E, but it's one of my favorites. So it basically flattens everything that you have, but if for some reason you have to go back to the layers, you're not merging everything. It flattens it on a new layer above it. Gotcha. And so it's, I'm a big fan of that. So is that like a like stamp visible or whatever that tool is in there where you're, you're essentially just taking everything and merging it together uh, in one false swoop, right? Yeah, it is. Um, it's merge yeah. visible, but then it's creating a new layer while you do that. So gotcha. I don't even know what the technical term <laughs> is for, but it's command option shift E. It's one of my favorites. I only know the shortcut. I like, I, cause yeah. I do the same exact thing and I learned it somewhere one day and I'm like, oh, this is a really great little trick to clean things up. And it almost gives you like milestones as you're working too. So you have like phase one, phase two. And for yeah. sure. Oh, and awesome. so, yeah, now we can extend that and it works. The reason it wasn't working before is cause we had painted some of the TV layer over here to get rid of that blue glow and it wasn't extending. So Photoshop's also a lot of times just problem solving. And if something isn't working, you might not be doing it in the order that the program was built for. So um, yeah, just trying to troubleshoot it and work through it, but it's designed in a way that makes sense. Just sometimes your brain uh, yep. isn't doing exactly as it was designed for. So yep. Yeah. How many times have you been like trying to make an adjustment on, on uh, either a different layer or you're not even on a new layer and you're just like wondering why, I'm like banging my head against the wall. I'm like, what is happening here? I'm like, oh, I'm not even on any layer right now. Or sometimes you're clicked in the opacity bar and you're trying to yep. hit like a shortcut, but it's saying, no, you're trying to affect 100% opacity. You can't change that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's keep looking through. So you can kind of see where these <laughs> scenes are. And for this one, it's like, it would be weird for there to be a really, really wide plank without anything there. But it's also hard to clean that up and just sample this. So I think I may end up trying to see what it looks like if we do one wide plank. And if it looks weird, we can go back. And once again, similar to yesterday, if you can sample it properly and do it right, sometimes this is a good situation for using the patch tool. But you have to be careful where you're sampling from and making sure that there won't be an obvious right. pattern. So the way that I use the patch tool, like I just did, you clone stamp a couple areas. And then at the top and the bottom so that we have a clean wood surface to choose from and then drag it over and boom, there mm. we go. Blends pretty nicely. The grain's yeah. matching up. It's pretty incredible that you can, can do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, and especially like with the walls like that, like you do have so much, you have a lot of different texture, a lot of different patterns that, you know, you can find ways to hide them in those seams. Yep. Um, instead of, you know, something that was like you were saying yesterday, you said like cement and different textures sometimes work a little bit better with the patch tool. And in this case, I think this works really well. Yeah. But for instance, if I was trying to do it right here where there's like very, very distinct wood grain and right. tried to sample it with that, 
it works, but it's a little bit more obvious. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of have to be selective of where you're using it and, and how you use it. So that one wide one that I was worried about, I actually think it kind of blends. It looks like maybe it's really, really small, that, that seam. So I think that one works. Yeah, you can't even really tell. <clears throat> so I meant to ask you this yesterday and yep. because we, we were on the topic of bananas and I think somebody in the chat asked where your banana tool is. Do you have a little um, banana tool hidden somewhere in Photoshop? My wife has one and I'm like, how do you get this banana tool in Photoshop? <laughs> I don't know about the banana tool, but would love to learn if anyone knows about it. Yeah, if anyone in here uh, knows how to get the banana tool, I know it's a big, it's a big Photoshop. Uh, I don't even want to call it a hack. It's just like the secret banana club. So, I don't, uh, what is it used for? Uh, it, it's basically like right below your like um, your color um, swatches down to the left, like under your magnify tool. Yeah. And and I honestly don't know what it's used for. It's basically just there. It's just like bright banana. And I'm sure there's a, 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 a use case for it. If anyone in the chat knows what the banana tool is actually used for, um, I don't, but um, yeah. So I figured I'd ask because you were all into the banana thing yesterday, but I'm glad to know I'm not the only one that doesn't really get it. <laughs> and so you'll notice right here, I just did, I clicked somewhere, I held shift and clicked again, and then it dragged it down because I wanted to, didn't want to use the patch tool because that's hard to be super precise with that. That's more for getting rid of something, but I wanted to close the seam so that it would be more subtle, but still have a seam. Gotcha. So we'll look up here and see. So this gap is bothering me a lot. So we'll try and figure out, hey, how do we clean that up? Um, and this edge is a little bit soft. So we'll probably use a soft brush and do that command or do that shift trick again with the clone stamp tool. So we'll start here and just go up to there. And let's see, that's cloning pretty nicely. All right, so what we'll do is essentially click <coughs> where we want to sample from, which a little bit below where that's starting. So maybe right here and then go up to there and let's just drag all the way across and we'll see if it works or not. And the, just with the shift key to just with the shift key. Line. Uh huh. And we want to get rid of that shadow. So we'll go all the way to here and let's see what happens. Boom. Holy crap. It's magic. So oh, yeah. makes a big difference. Huge. Yeah, both the side there, uh, the extension on the seam on the side and the top, like you're, when you, when it's not there, your eyes just don't, aren't drawn to it at all. But when it is there, like you kind of, you see that something's a little bit off. Yep. And there's certain areas now where you can see where we did it that, Hey, there's still this line here. So sometimes you have to go back in and just clean that up a little bit. I'll sample down here. Just try to make it not so obvious that it's a repeating pattern like that light area going through the wood grains feeling a little obvious so sometimes you get it in one stroke but usually yeah. it's a little bit of refining it so we're getting some information on our said banana tool let's hear it folks um all right i'm gonna try to explain this robert uh i think this is how you do it if you so it's basically just an easter egg like there's no there's no utility no for it. <laughs> utility for the banana, which is even funnier. Uh, so if you want to add a banana into your toolbar, you need to click on the three dot icon. Yep. Um, and then edit toolbar. edit toolbar, hold shift and click on done. And then you'll have a banana. <laughs> wow. That's electric. Oh, there you go. Now you got a banana. That's awesome. Thank you, Robert. I think uh, Adobe built that just for yesterday's tutorial. Seriously. That's awesome. Dude, I'm like definitely we, keeping that there. Oh, absolutely. That's a fun Easter egg. Cool. Any other Easter eggs anyone knows about in Photoshop yeah. that we got to learn? Yeah, Robert, you seem like the uh, Robert and Ferry and the whole gang. Any other Easter eggs? We'll, we'll see what we can uh, do here and add them. I was, to, like, I was like finding those. I'm trying to pimp out my Photoshop. Right. So we're just cleaning up the ceiling. There are a couple scratches. We use this thing called gator board for the ceiling, which is basically, mm. um, it's almost like a V flat if you've used one of those, but um, yeah, just by adding that ceiling to me, it really makes the shot feel like it's a real room versus, okay, the shot just ends at a certain height because we know it was a set. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, are you, so in building that, uh, ceiling, are you leaving, um, areas of the ceiling open for certain light sources? Are you covering the whole ceiling and then just lighting everything from, you know, behind the camera? Good question. So I only have enough gator board to a little bit further than what we see in camera. So that way I can still light from above. Gotcha. Um, so that's show business, baby. A little trickery. Yep. yep it is. You, everyone thinks this is what it looks like. And you, you, uh, flip the camera around, man. And it's about half of what you see. Yeah. <laughs> so there's still this little shadow up there. So we'll try and do our same trick again. Extend that up to here. Maybe we'll do a smaller. And let's try just dragging that all the way across. Oops. There yeah, we go. Now we're, I'm seeing something a little funky here. So we'll just extend this straight up so it doesn't look weird there. Let's pull out once again. Always good to zoom out and see. That's feeling pretty good to me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you would. I don't. I really don't think you'd. <laughs> excuse me. Pick up on that unless you were really, really, really digging for it. But yeah. Um, so we'll do some more cleanup. And like I was talking about yesterday, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but for me, which is different than a lot of retouchers, but my best retouching, in my opinion, is done when you can't tell that it was retouched. So I don't want there to be a different feeling to the image. I just am trying to clean up those things that I wasn't able to capture in camera or didn't think about right. um, or wouldn't have been possible. So for right now, I'm just cleaning up some of these pieces hanging off of the pant leg or the shorts, I should say. So I also wanted to ask you too, like along the same lines, um, your theory and thoughts on like retouching skin um, and, uh, not like imperfections, but just blemishes and things like that on, on your subjects as <laughs> a portrait retoucher. Like, do you, do you find that you just try to do the bare minimum to remove things and like keep part of their identity? Like what's your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I try like any birthmarks or things like that. I always keep unless I'm requested by the subject to remove them. But, um, yeah, those sorts of things I keep. I will retouch like acne and that sort of thing. I think people want to look like the best versions of themselves, but I think with skin retouching, less is more. So yeah, I definitely prefer to keep it as as realistic as possible. You'll see here, this wasn't like an advertising shoot, but a lot of times for advertising, you can't have tattoos um, mm -hmm. because whoever did the art on the tattoo technically owns that art, even if right. it's on a person. And so... Um, I think there was a pretty famous lawsuit with Mike Tyson and the hangover with his face tat from the tattoo artist of that. So um, I don't know if you'd actually get in trouble, but I also think he looks even better without it. So I yeah. just removed those uh, small little leg tattoos. And that's something when, that as an artist or as the subject, he probably didn't even notice. But right. Well, you also like in that context, that tattoo, I think those would have fit in in the 70s, regardless if you needed to worry about rights or not. But there could be some tattoos that are a little more like new age that anything yeah. that's out of place uh you know it goes it goes for a film shoot for any sort of like continuity that looks like it would take the viewer out of that 70s vibe um probably needs to go yeah and i like this little blue catch light in his eye it's real subtle but yeah. Yeah, me too. it gives him a little something so i'm gonna put it actually in the other eye too and even from far away it just gives it a little bit more of a glow and i feel like you can uh feels a little bit more alive with that. So what was your, um, there was a question a little while ago in the chat. I'm sorry for whoever asked this, I can't find it, but I'm going to try to get it answered. Um, what was your lighting setup for this shot? I know yesterday we talked about kind of the lights you had for the banana shoot, but, um, a little glimpse into the behind the scenes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I did this shot actually a few years ago. <laughs> so, I'm not certain I remember exactly, but if I had to guess, so I had the blue soft box here. Um, in the lamp, I have these things, they're called flash slaves, I guess, or flash bulb slaves. And so they are optically triggered from when another flash goes off, it will just go off as a flash because if you had a normal light bulb in there, but you're shooting with strobe at let's say F11, a normal light bulb would be a little too dark and you wouldn't really get much unless you drag the shutter for a really long time. 
So I, that's one of my favorite tricks. And I throw an orange gel on that, the blue gel on the soft box. And then I believe I had a warm um, Octobank from camera left um, with CTO on there, lighting our subject over here, cool out K. Yep. And then um, I think I had a general fill with a head going into a V flat that was um, lighting the overall scene, just filling it in a bit. Cool. And you can see the shadow from the light hitting cool out K over here on, um, on his back over there. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's how awesome. it was lit. And, uh, and Nicholas had a question too, um, uh, you know, when dealing with multiple subjects, like you are, uh, what's your method of, uh, your aperture? Are you shooting wide open or, um, what's your style when you're trying to get everybody in focus? Yeah, I try and focus on like the center part of the shot of who needs to be focused and then, uh, go from there. So yeah, it really, um, and then if I'm shooting with strobe, then I usually have the ability to shoot a longer depth of field. So let's actually look at this image and see if it says what it was shot at. All uh, right. Nope. Yeah. That's a good point too. Like the light, light not only gives you that style that you need, but especially when you're shooting in you know, a set like that, you know, being able to just blow a lot of light in there, especially with a medium format camera and still shoot at like an F11 or F13, like you're going to need a lot of light to compensate for that yeah so this is actually shot at f5 okay. um but i shot it 50 millimeters so not super super long lines and if we zoom in there's a little bit of fall off on waffle and cool out k looks to be pretty sharp yeah um and our fellow over here he looks to be pretty sharp so i would say that uh yeah for me in this shot it works even if cool or even if waffles just slightly slightly out of focus and you can see here i'm just kind of going in these are things that maybe you wouldn't even see from far away but once again i want to make sure everything looks pretty great even if it was viewed up close and do you find that because you're shooting medium format um sometimes you get a little bit of like leeway um in the softness factor from you know if i'm shooting on a dslr and and there's excuse me some fall off on some of my subjects with the resolution of a medium format um it seems like they're still fairly sharp um even if you shot it at an f5 and not like f11 yeah so this is actually shot on the 5ds so oh okay um but yeah i think that having that resolution always helps though i think that generally speaking focal length to focal length um medium format i think has even more fall off because of the compression mm. um but yeah and sometimes i will try and shoot um, like change my focus point in the shot if I think I'm going to composite the subjects and then make sure that I have a sharp version of each. Cool. Um, this Adidas logo is cool because it feels kind of retro, but you can't see the whole thing and I find it a little distracting. So I'm going <laughs> to take that away too. And with that, is that logo big enough where like if you didn't remove it and you ended up, uh, you know, having this in a gallery or selling this piece in a gallery that like Adidas could like not that they would do that but go or does after it, yeah go after it or does it have to be like way more front and center in the shot you know i'm not sure how it works for fine art i would say for advertising that would definitely be a note that a client would call out but yeah um yeah i'm not sure how that works in a fine art setting <clears throat> um one thing i'm realizing and i might just end up leaving because i don't know what i can sample but there's an apple box back here <laughs> You know what? I and, never even noticed that that was the Apple box. I just thought that was part of the, the uh, couch. And it blends in with everything that I'm like, mm, maybe it's not worth uh, messing with it. But the handle is to me what gives it away. Otherwise, I think it would be totally fine. Yeah. So what I might do is just sample this wood so that way we don't see the handle. And then it'll just look like wood texture back there. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's smart. Let's see. I might have to do a little patch tool so it doesn't look too uniform. Uh, random question from me. Um, as someone who's been on set myself quite a bit, what is the one like piece of grip equipment that you can't live without? Um, good question. This all the like... stuff that's like not sexy to like, oh, no one wants to like have a tripod. I mean, <laughs> yeah, Cardellini's are great. Um, 
One thing I've been using a lot lately is just like a an eight by eight frame with like a cheap silk, mm -hmm. but then I won't even use the whole frame. I'll just T-bar it okay, and then shoot light through there because um, it just gives you a really nice soft quality of light. So now if we zoom out, yeah, that really doesn't look like a, it looks like it could be a post or part of the, um, I think the reason we used that was to <clears throat> have the plant up higher. And okay. so I think the pot is on there, but it looks like maybe it's part of the pot or something like that. Yeah. But this grain looks to me a little obvious that it's been retouched. So we don't want too many repeating patterns. So let's just try and sample some of that out. Maybe if we're being real precise, we got time. Let's do it right. Fill this down a little lower. Yeah, I always kind of felt like with um, with any sort of grip, um, you know, equipment and floppies and silks and you know seamless backdrops and things like that. Like over time, after you sh start shooting more and you have ideas that you know limit you to a point until you have some of those things to help shape light and hide light and you know bounce things the way you need them. So I think it is just a matter of like progressing as an artist and what you need as a tool. Totally. Yeah, I have these foldable V flats that are also kind of cool because oh, you cool. can have a white bounce or a black bounce and they'll fit in like a normal car. Um, I think they're from this place called V flat world. So hmm. a little plug for them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can anyone on the live feed see anything else that they would clean up? I'm going to start doing color soon, but anything else? I mean, Let's it's see if it's so worth good. it, but I feel like this shoelace for some reason catches my eye. The one that's sticking out there? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So let's try and extend that. Out. It's like the old school, like fat farm, uh, <laughs> like pre fat farm, huge bulky shoelaces. Yep. Totally. Um, and everyone in the chat, we've got about 40 minutes and we'll be doing a, a nice little artist spotlight. Um, I know. Voodoo Val and Cody Bear, you guys plugged that a little while ago, but um, uh, anyone who wants to nominate themselves or nominate, you know, other artists, uh, please do. We always like to, uh, to show some love to photographers and other artists out there. And um, it's just an amazing, amazing community here on, on Behance. So that'll be coming up at uh, in about 40, less than 40 minutes. Let's see what else we want to do here. I don't know why I like, I have, so I have a skull um, head, not like a deer uh, skull, but some other animal in my living room. And I have a little cigarette hanging out of his mouth <laughs> because I just, I used to smoke and I don't smoke anymore. So I keep that as like the indicator, like, all right, if any of the, if shit hits the fan, it's there, but it also yeah. just like looks pretty funny. And I remember my, like that deer head reminded me of that. Cause I remember growing up and my uh, grandfather's hunting cabin. He had a big cigar out of the deer's mouth and I just thought it was kind of funny. That is funny. So yesterday we did a little bit of dodging and burning. So we're going to do some of that again today. Um, Ferry says there's also maybe a hot spot on the vase that could come down a little bit, like right. Oh yeah. That reflection. So yeah, I think that's a great point, Ferry. We'll see how easy it is to take out because there's a lot of tech. Yeah, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of repeating <laughs> patterns on there but if we think back to the tv that we had let's just duplicate this layer try putting this on top and if we disable the layer mask let's see well we can get rid of the the blue yep. highlight which i think is maybe the more distracting one so let's turn this back to uh the difference blending mode and let's try and get it to be just perfect right in that region that we're uh All right, that feels pretty good. So we're gonna turn this back and we're gonna delete this layer mask, put a new one on there, put it back to normal blending mode and let's just paint this puppy away. I'm getting a kick yeah, out of seeing cool. that banana on the left side still. I, right, I know. So let's see how that looks. Well, it's feeling a little too, uh, too dark. If we did that, we'd have to take away that whole blue glow on there, which I might be a bit too much. I kind of like that. But let's A and B it from farther away and see how we feel. Yeah, that's much so better. 
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that does totally. work. Yep. It creates a little bit more depth too on there. Yeah. And it feels realistic enough because maybe Waffle is standing far enough forward that <clears throat> he's blocking uh, that too. He's blocking that glow. So right. good suggestion. So what I'm going to do, because I don't want to have this whole layer there, I'm just going to call this lamp cleanup. And then we're going to apply the layer mask. So the way a layer mask works is whatever's painted black doesn't show through and anything that's white does. But if we want to apply it and then only see that area that's white showing through, we click apply layer mask and boom, that's it. So if you turn off everything else, that's uh, mm. the one little piece of it that's showing through. Good call. Anyone else have any suggestions on, on things um, to clean up for this? Yeah, we're getting real specific here. Let's see. So Love to hear it. So Steve. Yep. Uh, says not sure about loose laces on the shoes in the seventies. I lived through the seventies. Uh, Steve, thank you for that. Cause we did not, yeah. uh, in high school, loose laces on shoes came around, uh, with run DMC in the eighties. So taking it, taking it a little, uh, specific, but yeah, that's, that's definitely an interesting point. I'm not sure how we would actually like address it, address that without like completely totally. removing the shoes. But I think that's like a interesting point to bring up. Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe they are late 70s early 80s who knows i feel like his glasses maybe feel 80s-esque yeah definitely but it doesn't feel super modern um fairy we have a question uh this is a great great uh conversation too because i'm curious uh how do you go about selling fine art like a fine art print for the first time if that's something that you wanted to do yeah um there was a curator who worked with another really large artist who, or not another, I'm not a really large artist, but who worked with a different large artist. And he kind of took me under his wing and started sharing my work with collectors that he had a relationship with. But I think it's a hard thing to break into, especially with photography. Um, I think you can always do like a web store or something like that. Um, but I think the really high end galleries and the people making a really good living doing fine art. I think it is kind of a closed off world, unfortunately. So yeah, getting into that gallery world, um, I think, yeah, meeting with galleries and seeing if anyone's interested in it. But in the meantime, I think doing smaller things where you're selling prints to friends and family and just getting your work out there is always a good thing. The more people who see it, the better. Oh, absolutely. Well, I have a follow up to that too. Yeah. Um, and um, I've been getting into, uh, like the rest of the world, um, getting into NFT NFTs. photography and NFTs. Yep. And I, I saw that you, I think it was on super rare that you had, yep. uh, sold, uh, some collections of your set in the street. And, um, maybe you can talk to like, uh, for photographers out there, fine art and, you know, travel photographers, like how, uh, that world has kind of opened up a lot of, uh, avenues to sell your work as well. Yeah, NFTs are interesting. I feel like I'm maybe not the most educated to speak on it, but they, uh, yeah, it's essentially selling a digital version of your art and saying that, hey, this one specific piece is digitally owned by whoever decides to buy it. And it's cool because at least on Super Rare and I think a lot of the other platforms, in the past, if someone buys your art and then goes and resells the art for twice as much, you wouldn't see any of that. But now with right. uh, with these NFT platforms, you get, I think it's either 10 or 15 or 20% of the value that they sell it for. So that allows you as an artist to continue making money if your work um, elevates in price, which is cool. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, it definitely, it certainly opens up like in a way, like, I feel like I've seen more fine art photography in the space than I had before, because it's, there's an abundance of, you know, talent out there and photographers that are looking for, for another space to like market and sell their work. So, um, I feel like it's kind of flipped and it just allows a lot more people to, you know, share their work and actually like get compensated for it. As in, in the past, the only real way to, you know, make money as a fine art photographer is like through larger shoots and galleries, um, and, you know, selling to collectors, which is, which is still a great way to go, but it is a really hard, like you said, hard market to, to break into. Totally. So we're just dodging <laughs> and burning some areas, just creating a bit of depth. 
I love that phone. It, it's like a, it's just that a was one of the acne. Or... Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a circle. It's sweet. It's very cool. We'll zoom out in a second and see how much all this dodging and burning is helping, but it's really subtle and I like to keep it subtle, but it just gives it a little bit of life. It really makes you feel the light a bit more. I'm just going to continue to, to give you props too, just as like, as I see things, you know, in this, in this shot and in your work. And I think like one thing that you do really well, in addition to the lighting is like adding life to the scene and actually having movement without there being too much movement. So, you know, subtle and simple is just like him picking the phone up and being a part of the scene while also like kind of having his own little vignette off to the side. Um, and I think then like the conversation between waffle and your other character, like having them do something. And, you know, like I said, I come from a background of, you know, filmmaking and directing, and that's a huge piece of, of directing both a photo shoot like you like you do and film is being able to like provide context and direction that adds movement and life to a scene like this. Totally. Thank you for that. Yeah, man. So I'm darkening this post a little bit because I want the focus to be more about cool out K and less about the uh, the couch that he's on. Let's see. We'll zoom out. So a uh, dodging and burning, <clears throat> subtle, but to me, it really makes a big difference. And I darken this edge, almost adding a vignette. I might do a little bit more of that over here, but it just helps your eye get focused more on, on our characters and less on the, the wood and the furniture in the scene. Yeah, absolutely. Darken back here a little bit, just so that way the TV pops. <clears throat> One thing that I was thinking about doing, and I think we should do it, is uh, create a little bit of glow coming off of the TV. So let's duplicate this light and TV layer. We'll bring this all the way up here. And oops, actually we're gonna bring it all the way up here because that is off, the, or there was their merged layer. So we'll do that. And then we're gonna do a really, really large Gaussian blur. Let's see. Oh, that's now it kind of gives almost like a hmm. hazy, Oops, and that's too much. That gives it a little bit of a glow. And that might be too much or too bright. So we'll just bring it down. But it, there we go. Yeah. That's that to nice. me just adds a lot of life to it Absolutely. and brightens up that area. And a lot of times I'll use like a haze machine to create depth in a scene and kind of knocks down the highlights and lifts the shadows. And this has a similar effect. It's brightening the shadows behind the TV, which I think is nice. So a haze machine, is that kind of like a, like you just plug that in and run that when you're ready to shoot and just give it some like, some atmosphere basically? Exactly, yep. Just like a smoke machine, but it's a little bit more even as far as texture goes. Got it. Um, and yeah, it almost neutralizes <laughs> the scene in the sense that it darkens the, the highlights and lifts the shadows a little bit. And are you using, um, for like those kind of shoots, are you using any sort of like misters or polarizers or anything on the lens, uh, depending on, you know, what you're trying to get out of that? I haven't, but I've heard friends doing it and it seems like a good idea. So it's something I might, might pursue and, and try. So we're going to do a gradient. I want this yellow lamp to glow similar to how the TV did. So we'll do a screen blending mode. So it lightens everything and I'm going to do a gradient and we'll do a circle of it and we'll set the other area to black. So that way it won't show up. It's only the, uh, the gold that will, and we'll, all right. Ooh. So that feels a little too much for me, but let's lower it down to 20% and let's see what that does. That's still maybe a little bit too much. We can bring it down to 10% but subtle, but it really allows you to feel that yellow light hitting. Yeah. And let's play with different blending modes. Sometimes some work better than others. So I actually like lighten on this one compared to screen. Let's yeah, see. It gives it like a little more contrast too, which is nice. Yeah. And then let's play with it on lighten and see like how much we want to go. Okay. That's too much for sure. But maybe something like, like that feels good. Yeah. I like that. It gives yeah. it a little bit of glow. 
And if we want to try something similar coming in from off of camera, right, we can just duplicate that, bring it over here, maybe go up a little bit, but then you can feel that light that's hitting him just mm -hmm. a little bit. And it makes you feel like, oh, there's something just off camera. To me, that really makes it feel a little bit more cinematic. Yeah, definitely. Kind of adds that atmosphere. Well, what's cool is like all like these little effects and, and um, adjustments that you're making on the layers, like it's it's almost fun to take these uh, effects to the extreme so that you can see like almost start at the highest level and then just start working your way back as opposed to starting really subtle and then, you know, blowing it out from there. I feel like that probably helps helps to see what the most extreme version of it can be. Totally. Yeah, so yeah, cool. if we turn these on and off, you can see what that glow is doing. <clears throat> and like we were talking about yesterday, always good to go back and see where you started and where you're at and have you gone too far or not far enough. You can see all those little white specks on the carpet and on the suitcase. Feels really nice seeing that all cleaned up. Yeah, it looks awesome. Ceiling's looking good. What else are we noticing, folks? Anything Anything else that's super obvious? I'm gonna do some more color work if we have time. Yeah, no, we got we definitely got some time. We got about 20 minutes before we do a little spotlight, and then uh, and then we should have probably another 15 after that. So whether you want to keep cranking on color, whether you want to pull something else up, but we have plenty of time. So awesome. That's cool. Yeah, let's try playing with the color. So you can almost experiment and see time of day. This feels much more like night. This feels more like daytime. Just kind of play with it and see, and maybe we'll do it selectively in certain areas. So maybe we'll set this warm. Doing a little bit more red in there. It's kind of cool too when you're playing with those midtones. Like if you were to drag those yellows over and the green, you almost can like put yourself in a different location uh, completely. Like you can, you almost feel like you're maybe like down south somewhere and like the you know heat of the summer. Like like you can kind of envision the the area you're in as opposed to if you're turning it a little more blue and magenta. That that night scene completely changes the feel. You know, totally. Yeah, and I'm kind of liking it warmer, but maybe we don't want everything warm. So we'll turn this off and uh, start going through selectively in different areas. So I want a little bit of warmth coming from here with that glow, that light that we turned on. And then definitely want some hitting his face that's warmer. A little bit of warmth from there. And then we're going to want warmth coming off of this light. And I can really feel that now. Maybe even up into some of the wood. Yeah. Some of that wood was feeling a little too cool for me. And we'll do some over here. Start painting it in where it feels good. So you are uh, you hit on this a little bit yesterday, but process-wise, like, and specifically for casting for this, this shoot and a lot of the other shoots you do, um, if you did this like what you say like three years ago yeah a couple years ago and when you casted uh them for this was this um something that you paid paid out of pocket or was this like a, a barter situation where they got you know some of the photos as well yeah this was a barter situation so i explained to them hey this is something i'm interested in doing but don't have really a budget to do it and they were really excited because they just wanted they're almost like a crew or whatever and so they wanted shots of them all together. So it was just a good fair trade that everyone cool. was excited about. And did you go through a casting agency for that? Or did you just, you knew them before or? Yeah, I had worked with Waffle before um, and had followed him on Instagram for a while and he's doing awesome stuff now. I think he just designed a clothing line with Urban Outfitters and stuff, but he's just oh, wow. an awesome kid. Um, not a kid anymore, <laughs> but awesome dude. And so, um, yeah, I had known him from that. So let's see here. All right. So this is our warmer layer. We can see it's pretty nice where we're doing it. And then let's do one that's cooler and find some areas where that TV should be hitting them and make it feel nice and cool. Let's try that. Once again, you want to be subtle. So you can start with a lot and then always tone it down. 
Um, yeah, trying to hit some of these areas on the side of his face. And even that just on waffle to me makes a real big difference. Oh yeah. It feels much more cinematic. <clears throat> cool out K's got a lot of this blue hitting him. Yeah, and so much of it is just like, you know, painting that light in. Um, yeah, and just exaggerating stuff that you already had practically. I don't like right. to add stuff that didn't exist, but if something existed, pushing it just a little bit further so that it feels powerful and, and motivated. We're getting a couple of more Easter eggs uh, in the chat. It seems like people are interested in these. Love it. Um, there's one, Robert says, if you rename layer comp, which is, I'm not sure where, um, to layer monkey zero, you'll suddenly see a cute monkey face icon looking back at you instead of the standard comps icon. Where is layer comp? Layer map. Let's see. Layer comp to layer monkey zero. Okay, export layer comp. I yeah, layer comp. layer comps. There okay. You go. So and then if we do what? Let's save we, our work actually. Definitely <laughs> save it because this is gonna before we go too crazy. It says rename layer comp to layer monkey zero. And you'll suddenly see a cute monkey face icon looking back at you instead of the standard comps icon. I'm not sure what the standard comps icon would look like, but let's see. And we will call the, oops, let's go here, desktop. Do you, um, when you save projects and when you're working, are you working straight off of a laptop or do you have uh, your externals that you're editing off of and then kind of dragging them onto backups? Uh, it depends. A lot of times I'll work off of external drives and kind of keep my actual, now that I mostly work on solid state drives. Yeah, they're so, oh my God, they're so much faster. Yeah. And so tiny. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's try this layer comp thing. All right, so new layer. What are we calling it? Uh, layer monkey zero. So layer uh, and spaced. Layer, then space, monkey, then zero. Uh, I guess that's right, Robert, if you're still here. And then if you press OK, you'll suddenly see a cute monkey face icon looking back at you instead of the standard comps icon. I'm not sure if we did that right or what we should be looking for. I don't know. Let's try one more time. Do Layer. Cap do capital. Monkey. Zero. Zero. I think we're getting duped. Yeah. Sorry. We might have caught this uh, Easter egg. <laughs> There's a lot of very confusing ones. What did Steve say? He says, one more interesting Photoshop Easter egg. Hold down the command key on Mac. Uh, control on Windows. I think you're on a Mac. Yeah. Command key on Mac and go Photoshop about Photoshop to see the beta art screen. Oh, wow. Whoa. Hey, that's cool. That is cool. That's pretty sweet. So that's the, that's what didn't get made. <laughs> that's cool. fun. Yeah. Any Good other Easter eggs? Any other Easter eggs? <laughs> but more importantly, any other, uh, any other uh, retouching things in this image that you guys see? Um, we've done a lot so far. And by we, I, I had zero part in this, but Justin <laughs> has done a lot and I've just been watching. So, I mean, you've done a lot. It's. Let's see. So I actually Photoshopped this before to uh, do a trial of it. And let's see what that looked like before. So this is what we did, and this is what I had done before. So I think adding that glow <laughs> definitely gives a little bit of a different look and feel. Yep. Um, it was also cropped a little bit tighter, so that edge on the right side that we're seeing wouldn't be thrown off by that. Um, but yeah, I extended the carpet down a little bit further, which we're not doing. Um, but I, good call. Whoever once again recommended cleaning up that blue light hitting that lamp. Cause I think that's a lot cleaner without that. Definitely. Yeah. I think that helps a lot. I mean, and I sort of like both like interpretations of color, but I do like that. The one that you had done with 
it's a little, it almost looks a little like contrast, more contrast because of that, um, the glow that you did in the light, which I do really like. Yeah, I think we went too far with the glow though. So I just toned it down. I think that feels a lot better where it's so subtle, you can't really see it, but you can feel it. And that's yep. usually what I'm going for is chasing that feeling. Yep. Um, so one thing that would be fun to see is what if we Photoshop them into the TV and they're watching themselves on TV? Oh, ooh, a little inception action. So let's try that and see if we can yeah. make it look fairly realistic. So we're going to, once again, merge everything. So we're pretty happy with how this is looking. We'll go back down to the TV cutout and that's it. Okay. So let's resize it. So it's roughly that size. Let's see how this works. Let's see how realistic we can make it. Go deep into a rabbit hole. Yeah. So we'll resize it to there. And then what we're going to do is play with the free transform <laughs> and we'll play with distort. So we'll try and get the corners roughly to where they should be. Let's see how realistic we can make this. And if anyone in the chat still has a TV like that in their house, like call me up, I will gladly come and pick it up. <laughs> that is awesome. Not for really utilities anymore, but just for a yeah, for like a little fun prop. Sake. Yeah. All right. Well, that doesn't look real at all, but that's okay. <laughs> it's gonna take a little time to get there. So we'll choose our selection of the TV again, and let's put that there. Let's say we turn this down in opacity just a little bit. Okay. That still doesn't feel real. So let's keep playing with it and figure out how we make this feel more real. So you do, th you do things so fast, like even just, even just your uh, masking ability. I mean, like, I feel like that is such an important factor in just speed too, and being able to mask so efficiently that you can do these things, things without cutting, cutting, you know, everything out for hours on end. Totally. And part of that is just like keeping the, uh, mask and being organized with what you already had <clears throat> right um so we're just warping this a little bit because i feel like tvs back then centers a lot bigger than the outside edge um so we'll just play with that warping a little bit let's see that and i feel like we can also maybe play with it let's do distort hmm. let's see what do we want to do to it what if we want to make it look like they're a cartoon on TV? So let's do oil paint. Let's see what this is looking like. Let's turn preview on and then we can see. Now the the effects that you had in there previously, like the grain uh, noise, you know, and blur, are those yep. things that you would then have to add on top of this, or could you use those effects and like pull them through? Since totally. Those layers already exist. Yep, we could definitely pull those through. Wow, that's um, kind of cool. Yeah, super fun. And it kind of takes away and hides some of the, uh, let's see, some of the low fineness that we're uh, going for. So let's see. Choose the lighting angle. So I think we want to go from the top right. Let's see what shine does. So that looks a little too much. <laughs> Yeah, that's like clarity, just like bump the clarity. Yeah, and I actually think the less you have of that, yeah, the better. That really does look like a painting or something. <laughs> Excuse me, everyone. So we're seeing a little bit of an edge of where the TV was before. So let's ex let's make our whole uh, layer mask slightly larger, mm -hmm. and boom. No more edge. Now they're watching themselves on TV, but it yeah, still looks cool. like it's just uh, Photoshopped in there. So let's try again and maybe we'll try a different technique maybe. So, or we'll try doing it from scratch, but let's choose that selection and we'll, and actually what we're going to do, we're going to do a clipping mask again. 
So it will just go over the area that we already have. Let's find a nice light blue, throw it in there and do paintbrush. Okay, well, that took away everything. So let's lower the opacity just a little bit. And maybe we'll do, play with these blending modes and see what looks best. Maybe screen would be good. We'll go up just a little bit. It's like there's a surveillance camera or something. Yeah, I know, I know. It's cool though. And like little by little, you start to really like make that feel like it's a part of the scene too. And Totally. Let's play with curves too. Once again, do a clipping mask and let's just play with how bright, like feels like there's not enough contrast now. So maybe if we add some contrast back in there, it'll still feel illuminated. When you, uh, when you're editing your like contrast and blacks and highlights, are you primarily using curves or using curves with, uh, the other like basic exposure settings? Mostly curves. Yeah. I find that you have a lot of control with it. And like one thing that makes this maybe look, uh, or would make it look more like a TV is if you play with the color channels within the curve. So if we add a little bit of blue to it, mm that sort of thing. And you can do blue even just in selective areas. So just in the shadows or just in the highlights, which is pretty neat. So we'll add just a little blue glow to that. Maybe we want to play with the greens. No, that's too much. Let's see what we play with the reds a bit. Yeah, I mean the red, what's cool about the reds is like you're almost in doing that, you're then creating like an entire warm you know, cause like the cool part of that image previously was sort of that TV glow. So yeah. you, you almost like change the, the, the feeling mood, of the, image. the feeling of the entire image with just that one subtle tweak. Totally. So that's looking pretty cool. Now let's make a decision and say, Hey, do we like it? Actually, and we didn't add grain yet. So we're going to do that. No. Yeah. What do we think in the chat? Do we like uh inception? art here do we like this uh this group of guys looking at themselves or do we think it's it's better with just the digiversity <laughs> and we're going we did a clipping mask again so we'll add noise and it will just affect that one area that's too much noise i would say there we go very bad reception <laughs> super super tough and you can, once again, you can start with a lot and then just lower the opacity here, get it to an area that you're happy with. So how long, um, time-wise, like when you were actually, if you can remember, uh, shooting this, does the entire process from, you know, building the set to actually like blocking and, you know, finally taking the photo, how long does that whole process take you? Um, I would say maybe four or five hours. The okay. set build was fairly easy because it was just these flats. We already had the flats built. And so we just put the Luan, the wood on there. Yep. And then the, um, the shelf was pretty quick. And then everything else was just kind of carrying it in. I shot it at that prop house. So cool. we didn't have to move things too far. But um, yeah, so that wasn't too bad. And the other thing we'll do, let's try putting the glow on there again. Um, so this one we are going to do on its own layer. Hayden says scan lines would be cool. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. You know what? Let's try that instead of the... So let's figure out how we would do that. Stylize. What do we got? Render. Scan line. Um, let's play with some of these distorts. Yeah, I was going to say like a ripple or a displace. Maybe we can kind of create some shapes that way. Yeah. And one thing that's cool is if you convert something to a smart object, you can put filters on it and then take it away. And it's pretty easy to adjust that way. So let's do that. <laughs> Let's go into the image, figure out where that TV is. 
Let's see. There we go. All right. So I don't think that's quite the right effect. Let's see what Nicholas is saying polar coordinates. Let's try it. Let's try it. I mean, one of the best things about Photoshop is honestly, store it's polar it's coordinates. Around. There we go. Let's see. Let's see what we're what we're working with. Whoa. I'm not sure if that's it. Polar to rectangular. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, that looks pretty crazy. Huh. You know, and like a lot, of those, other things. a lot of those effects, it's hard because you're not sure. Like some of them you can adjust you know, blurs and noise and things like that. But that it seems like some of the other effects, you're kind of stuck with whatever the effect is and you, it's hard to like pull it down. Yeah. Whoa. Pointalize. So that's where you would do like a ton of uh, dots on a paper. Gotcha. Uh, oopsies. Let's go back. <clears throat> so we can do filter gallery. And I think that's easier than to uh, play around with each one. Let's see what we can do. I think this is how I first started working in Photoshop. Me like too. Years ago, I would just be like, let me just open something and let me throw a colored pencil. I was like on vacation somewhere. I'm like, yep. shit, that's so sick. And I'm like, Bob, look at what I did. Um, so let's see. So if you do this just vertical, maybe this looks like the <clears throat> line effect we're going for. Maybe not. So Hayden says you could also make a white black pixel pattern and then soft light overlay or screen that. Um, yep. We, it might have to be, Nicholas says might have to be with another shape, maybe creating a pattern or a texture from Google or plug Adobe stock. Cause you could probably find a lot of those there too. Totally. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. great for that. Sometimes, sometimes it is, it is uh, necessary to pull some of that stock in if you can't find the right effect. Yeah. This looks like a rainy day. Totally. <laughs> yeah, it looks like some like old mosaic glass. Yeah. Looking through it. After all that though, I think I do prefer it with uh with just yeah. the static on there. It yeah, kind of leaves too. a little bit more mystery to it, but it's always fun to keep that there and um, we'll call it TV inception. Yeah, and it's fun to play around with that kind of thing too. Like I think in, in doing this sort of format too, I mean, you have two hours to really like go through all this stuff, but even when you're at home doing this and, and for people in the chat, you know, like spending the time to take your piece one step further, even if it is a little bit much just to learn new techniques and to kind of practice is, is a great, great thing to do at home. Yeah. And I'm playing with this. <clears throat> All right. Um, but I'm feeling like we're in a pretty good spot. I'm just doing an overall uh, curves adjustment at this point to try and dial in the overall brightness and all that jazz. But I think we're looking pretty good. Everyone seems to like the static too, I think. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you got, you got a lot of people on board. Nicholas, Brent, Hayden. The whole gang likes the static and I have to uh, concur. But um, I think we're going to, um, we have about a minute left here. We're going to dive into an artist spotlight. So um, let's see. Let me see what else I want to do. I'm just, sometimes you got to take one second um, to figure out how you want to process it for the last bit. What else should we do? I don't know if we want to do something to the deer, but I mean, it's feeling pretty good. Sometimes you, uh, <laughs> sometimes you're like, all right, everything already looks good that you don't want to less is more. Yeah. But we'll, it really uh, is. So one thing I like to do when I'm playing with these curves layers <clears throat> is there's a big difference between a luminosity mask and normal. Um, so if you're on normal, it affects the, color a bit and if you do luminosity i noticed it doesn't do that as much 
and a little bit brighter like that allows you to see some of the details, but that might be too much. So we'll just take it down just a bit. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. I meant to, I meant to ask you too, like when you're making your, your color adjustments, are you using the camera raw filter at all inside of Photoshop as like a smart object? Or are you just adding your adjustments using curves, hue, saturation, that kind of thing here? Usually I'll do an overall color pass in some sort of raw processing program, whether it's Lightroom or something else. And then, um, after I do that, I, um, we'll bring it in here and then do finer adjustments. Cause that's kind of an overall color pass. And right. you can see like with these color layers, we're doing stuff that's a little bit more specific in a more particular area. Gotcha. Sweet. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, why don't we take a little, a little break. Let's head on over to an artist spotlight and Justin, I think I'm going to try to share my screen so you can keep it up. Um, so maybe we can flip on over to what I have going on here. Um, and, uh, everyone let me know once you can actually see what is on said screen. Very excited, um, to show off some of Eric's work here. Cause it is stunning. Just surrounded by a whole lot of talents up in here. And, uh, just makes me very inspired. All right. Let's see here. Thank you everyone for sticking around. And like I said, um, let me know guys once we're, uh, actually, you know what, Justin, it might be easier if you just use sure. yours. Yep. <clears throat> Let's jump on in. Since you have it already up. Totally. There we go. Perfect. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we are doing an artist spotlight right now. This is something that we do in our two day, uh, you know, Photoshop and photography, um streams and uh let's go to the about page yeah before we just to see who we're, we're working with here but uh we got a georgia native eric hart uh eric thank you so much for sharing your incredible work with us um and uh really what i wanted to do justin and like feel free chime in as a professional like let's let's just kind of shout him out and let's uh maybe go through some work that stands out to us and and give him a little love and uh we went to Tish. I was a big fan of Tish. I wish I could have could have gone to school there. I have a lot of friends that were in the fine arts program. Yeah. So I think this is a project that Eric did with his grandparents <clears throat> in uh, the Ivy Park Clothing Company. I think that's owned by Beyonce. Oh, okay. Oh, that's um, but this background's really neat that he shot against. Yeah, it almost looks like uh, it almost looks like a deliberate like seamless or wallpaper or something it just looks really cool totally and i mean that's one of those things too if you scroll up a little bit justin where you know talking about retouching like the being very deliberate on like leaving those creases there as that's part of the style of that shot you know like he could have very easily um removed that but i feel like then you don't get the sense that it is kind of like an artificial background for sure let's see Yeah, very cool project. Yeah, and his parents just, or grandparents have so much style and swagger, and swagger to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Beautiful space too. Super cool. Yeah, I mean, your subject in a in a situation like this is really everything, and like the chemistry there is really cool. So let's see what else we got. These are beautiful, black oh, and white, wow. gorgeous. When you, uh, Justin, when you study other photographers and you know, fine art, um, photographers like Eric here, like, what are you, what are you inspired by when you see work like this? A lot of times I do like to go to the personal work section <laughs> instead of commission, because I feel like that's just a much better look at figuring out who these people are and what they actually would choose to shoot on their own if, if it isn't client-based. And I think it mm -hmm. tells a lot about a person, Absolutely. um, when you go to their personal work. So that's cool that he had this, uh, window yeah. display in New York. That is so cool. Let's yeah, that's that. uh, that's definitely a goal of mine to be able to see my work printed on a on a billboard or a large poster. And congrats, Eric. I mean, that's that is a really big deal. We got a little spike in there. Perfect for the, uh, the yeah mode of the project we're doing today. Seems uh, seems relevant. 
yeah what a what a great guy and and uh as a filmmaker i find a lot of inspiration from spike lee too and eric it seems like you find find some inspiration in your work as well oh that's cool really pretty i love the hair yeah it's great oh uh, i know it's a it's a it's really i think it's important for any photographer out there to really like we get so caught up in either our own work or small format you know digital representations on instagram and twitter that we forget to like really go to someone's website and see some of their work like if you have a big monitor i really i come into my office and i i vibe out sometimes and just get inspired by a work like this and you know throw some music on and, and just study you know how professionals do what they do totally you get a really good sense of the diversity of what he's got going on here these are awesome they're really cool. really powerful yeah yeah and you can see a theme too you know like very um the african-american theme and and obviously like his identity and and a lot of those stories really shining through in the work he's creating here totally <clears throat> yeah like really strong contrast in these images between the lights and the darks it's really nice and it is very difficult to photograph black and white like that and edit black and white i think everyone's not everyone that's kind of a generalization but the idea that it's pretty easy just to like oh here slap on a black and white filter but I feel like it requires so much skill to do it well. Yeah. This is a shoot he did for Rolling Stone, it looks like. Oh, cool. I <laughs> love that with the sunglasses. Oh, that's sick. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that color is very pops like your style, too. Totally. Very cool prop. Love the belt. A lot of commissioned work, Eric. This is really, really cool to see. And, yeah, and uh, I think Eric is still in school, just about to finish. So he's wow. still Spike Lee wow. oh, for Dior. Love that. Talk about a guy with swagger, man. I mean, can't Spike, beat Spike. It's very hard to beat Spike Lee, and uh, you know, a passionate, passionate guy who has like a very unique style. And I think that's that's just just of years of creating and and kind of going against the grain and against the mold and. Eric, you certainly have a, a style that stands out. A lot of work with Spike. And that's one thing with celebrity work. Sometimes you work with someone and they like working with you and keep bringing you back. So it seems like Eric's done a really good job with that. That's cool to see some of the behind the scenes too. Yeah. And I think what's so, what's so cool about all these galleries um, and something that you can kind of pick up on is the diverse, you know, composition of images so that they don't all feel like it was like even this, you know, they're whether they're shot in the same day or not or same location, like they all feel unique and different from one another. Uh, and Justin, I know you have a lot of that on your site as well and in your portfolio where it ke it keeps things fresh. And as a professional, it really shows off the, you know, the flex that you can have as a photographer. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, great work, Eric. Really, uh, really pleased that we were able to share share what you got going on, um, and we will continue to to follow along on your journey. Again, thanks, man. Um, this has been this has been cool to uh, to see. Yeah, if anyone's looking for a new follow, his Instagram is uh, Eric Hart Jr. Yes, please. And Eric he Hart just Jr. won. Uh, it used to be the PDN thirty. Now it's just called the thirty. But he. Uh, he won that yesterday, which is really cool. And looks wow. like he was Forbes wow. 30 under 30. So really oh good things God. ahead for Eric. And he's, uh, he's actually been on set with me a couple of times to help me out and just a really great all around guy. So awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, congrats on the 30 for 30. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, we need more photographer, uh, and creatives like you in the world. So, uh, again, thank you for sharing. And, and again, to those in the chat and to those that do watch this, um, you know, I encourage you to continue to share your work on Behance um, and, you know, send in your submissions if you uh, know somebody or you want to uh, to be a spotlight as well. We love doing these kind of things. Awesome. Sweet. Well, we can jump back over here. One thing I haven't talked about is, is how I like to save out my images um, to get them ready to put them on Behance or Instagram or whatever it might be. Um, so we'll clean up a couple more things and then I'll save this out and maybe even start uh, uploading it to Behance just so people can see what yeah. that process is like and sounds great and how all that works. 
I finally funny. picked up, uh, speaking of this film camera, I finally picked up, I have, I had a 35 millimeter years ago and I, for some reason sold it and I've been like just dying to get another one. And so I finally got one that looks very similar to that yesterday. Nice. And I am just like, all of this uh, photography talk has got me more inspired to, to put it to use this year. That's awesome. All right. So we will save this out. I'm going to do a new, uh, let's call this V2. And notice that it's a PSB file. Um, that's a large document format. If you try doing it as a PSD, a Photoshop file, if it's over two gigs, it won't save. So um, if you're, when in doubt, you can just always save it as a large document format. I don't know any downside to it myself. So okay. um, we'll call this V2 because it's the second one and we'll just save that. Before we finally export it as JPEGs and all that, are there any other comments or thoughts of any other retouching notes now that we're looking at it nice and up close? I think everybody seems pretty on board with what you've done. Um, they seem kind of blown away with the whole process. And actually we got a couple comments and uh, questions here about the saving technique. So I think that's a perfect segue. Um, we perfect. do have one, do you have one more question here from Nicholas? Um, and uh, yeah, great questions, guys. I'm actually curious about this myself. What was your, what would you say your first big break was um, in your career? Like that kind of got you feeling like you had some momentum as a, as a professional photographer. Yeah, I was doing a project called set in the street where I was building <clears throat> these photo sets out of furniture that were like mostly thrown away in New York. I stored it in my friend's backyard, would build these sets outside on the sidewalk, <laughs> mostly without a permit. And then after the shoot, I would leave it up and let anyone take a photo in the set. And so I, um, I think the big break was I had done a few of them and I hadn't shared the final photos from it, but my friend at the time submitted it to Gothamist, which was like a New York, um, New York, like news website. And they had posted like, Hey, look at this pop-up like living room on the street. And, uh, I got an email from New York magazine asking if they could see the final images and, and if I'd be interested in, um, having them published. And so, when that came out, that really opened up a lot of doors. And I eventually got an email from the Times Square Art Alliance asking if I wanted to do one in Times Square. And initially my reaction was, which one of my friends is so bored that they're sending me a prank <laughs> email pretending to be Times Square because there's no way that Times Square is actually allowing me to do this and inviting me to, to do it in Times Square. And so wow, getting to do that in Times Square and having you know thousands of people literally seeing it every hour or every day was, was really cool. We were there for five days. So wow, I'd say that was kind of my, my big break. <laughs> That's incredible, man. And, and, uh, certainly an inspiring story and one that like, I feel like there's no linear path to, you know, breaks and, uh, career moves like that. And it really comes down to like, you were creating something that you were interested and passionate about. And if you submit it somewhere and, and someone else also sees that passion, then, um, you know, it can happen sort of overnight. So that's a really, really, really amazing project. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll plug that as well. I mean, that's how I found your work. And, um, I know you have, uh, on your website set in the street and, um, you know, all over your Instagram and one of your first collections on, on super rare, I believe. So very, very cool stuff. Thank you. One big retouching <laughs> thing I just noticed is that this line, this corner is not very straight. Mm. Um, so let's try and fix that before we export it. And that's why sometimes I'll, I'll have five uh, final versions or whatever, because you always notice something and, and I want it to be perfect. Um, so let's open up the liquify tool. Yeah, the final, final version or the final, final, final version or the underscore final, this is the final version. Yeah. And, then, and then you just delete them all and you're like, no, this is the final version. Totally. So we're just gonna drag this over and try and get it as straight as possible. Um, wood does warp in reality, so it doesn't need to be totally perfect, but I wasn't really happy with how it was looking before. So let's see if we can get a little straighter. Yeah, especially with that Luan, like it's so flimsy that it just falls Yeah. Apart. Totally. And it's feeling pretty good to me, except for right above the TV, but we can't really warp that because it will warp <laughs> the TV. So we might just clone stamp that just a little bit to get that perfect. 
I always like to turn the, let's see, bring this up. I always like to turn the preview on and off to kind of see mm. what effect I had and if I did enough. And that's feeling pretty good. Yeah, that feels much straighter. Maybe this one needs to come over just a bit. Let's see. Yeah, so that's feeling much better. We have this guide to see, and it looks like we can actually go a little bit further closer to the deer. So let's try that one more time. <laughs> it's funny that he's actually the only he, she, um, whoever it. this, this <laughs> deer it is, is the only subject that's actually looking off camera. Yeah. You know, like we got everybody kind of doing their thing and this deer's got like, the inside look into what's really going on. This, uh, I was just trying to play Liquify has a tool that you can, um, oh <laughs> almost like blow tool, but if you do it with the eyes, it's pretty funny. That's pretty cool. It looks a little terrifying now, so we will not do that. It looks like the um, deer just ate a bag of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, we'll just expand it a tiny bit under the, uh, move it to the right over here. So as you finish up some of these little touches here, Justin, I wanted to ask you, um, and I think, you know, for anyone else who's interested, like who, uh, who do you look to for inspiration or what do you look to for inspiration when you're, when you're, you know, creating a lot of these concepts? Yeah. I mean, I think film and TV is a pretty big thing for me. And then I try not to, and I definitely am still on Instagram and that sort of thing, but I've been trying more so lately to find inspiration from, things that are not modern or contemporary. So I, uh, I got two books, one on advertising in 1950s and one on advertising in 1960s. But I've been looking at those a lot because there's high production value because it's advertising. But those concepts are so old that it feels like if you repeat it, it'll still be fresh. Mm. Um, versus if I did a concept that's similar to something that someone else had recently done, um, it feels like that would feel a little bit more like copying. And I think copying, if it's as old as 1950s or 1960s is a little bit more acceptable. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, that's a big thing for me. So we're just going to yeah, straighten cool. this line and let's see, maybe we'll straighten. You can feel a little <laughs> bit of a bow in the wood. There we go. Now let's see. Maybe that's making it worse, actually. We'll keep it nice and light. I think from far away, that looks pretty convincing. So let's run through saving. So like we said before, up here, you can see it's a PSB, not a PSD, because the file's a little bit too large. And we'll just save that out. Um, and then, all uh, right, let's see. We're going to go to File, Save As. And then make it a JPEG is what I typically do. And then embed color profile. So I always like to edit when I'm processing a raw in Adobe RGB, not sRGB. Okay. Um, because sRGB compresses it for web colors. And we want to make sure that this is, uh, will look good if we print it. So um, save that. Quality, I always do 12. So it's a maximum and you can kind of get a preview sometimes of how big the size will be. So it's going to be 27 megabytes. Um, and then I always just keep this baseline. I don't know the, uh, yeah, I've never noticed. I never really know the difference of that. Yeah. And then I don't do a mat or anything like that. I always, uh, just keep it on none. So let's save that. Perfect. And then. If you hit option, um, or sorry, command shift S, sorry. If you do command option shift S, that will do save for web. Mm. And this is cool too. If you ever wanna make a GIF or something where you have multiple layers, this is where you would change the JPEG to GIF and you can process it out that way. Um, and so here is where I want to convert it to sRGB if you see this button. And we can look at the difference. This right now 
is without it converting to sRGB. And if you click it, you'll see there's definitely a color shift. Oh yeah. Um, and so that is something that, uh, that you're sacrificing by making it web ready. And then quality, I always keep it at a hundred. Um, and then for image size, I'm uploading this. I want it to work on Facebook. I want it to work on Instagram. I want it to work on Behance and all that jazz. So I'm going to change the image size to 2400 and it will automatically, I usually do by cubic for how it's going to resize it. And then I will save that. So that would see. and that would change the file size i'm assuming as well right yep drastically so let's go back to our folder adobe files and then so i have one folder called jpeg that i put my jpegs in and then i have one called web jpeg and then format i do image only settings default settings and save that and so now if we go to our folder Here's our web JPEG. And this file is only 2.7 megabytes. Mm. And <clears throat> let's copy that over or let's bring in, let's see. Um, if you look at our seventies kid, we'll just put it in this folder Oops, for one second. We'll call this one low res or we'll call it web. Cause it's not the resolution of it is smaller um or like the amount of pixels but the quality of it is still high quality which is what we want then we'll bring this one in and let's see if there is a color difference between the two so that's your that's your web yeah that's your uh and you can see i mean it might be hard on the stream but the high resolution one's just a little bit sharper too and that's because yeah. i'm probably previewing it right now larger than 2400 pixels um, like the dots and the catch lights and the eyes pops a little bit more, but so then now you have, um, and then I would do a folder called PSD and I'll put my PSBs even in the PSD folder. Um, but that's basically just meaning that in my mind that it's a working file. Gotcha. And we'll put the JPEG here. We'll put our banana PSD there. So this is usually how I structure all my folders. And one trick that I'll usually do if we're doing it properly, today's date is January 13th. So I'll do the date. So 2022, 01, 13, and then underscore Adobe files is the name of the project. And then whenever you look on a hard drive, everything's organized by date. Mm -hmm. So anything you shot in 2020 is going to be higher than 2021 and that sort of thing. And then I just have a running um, tally that way. And it's really easy to find files and when I'm renaming a session after I've shot it or importing it, if I'm not shooting tethered, I always do that as the preface for it. Um, so th I'll do the job name and then the file number. And then if down the line I ever need to find a file, it's really easy to find it that way because you can, uh, okay, I know that I did this shoot in January of 2022. Then you could just look, go straight to there. And I have all my uh, hard drive organized by year, but then I have a server with all of my images and it just makes it so much easier to find things and search for projects that way. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's, again, it's not like the most glamorous part of the whole process, but I'm I'm like you where I have to have everything organized. Um, and I, I do the exact same thing where every, every year is a different year and then it's broken down by month, whether it's a personal project, client project, but it's important to, like you said, to have that consistency and in like file structure and folder structure. Cause eventually like you might have to come on to Adobe live three years later and explain this entire process. And if you hadn't have the, had those saved and organized, like it'd be a much bigger deal. Yeah. And I've also, there's been plenty of projects where I'm traveling and I'm not at my computer, but if it's really organized, well, if a client <laughs> reaches out and says, Hey, we actually want to license an extra image from you you got to make it in a situation where someone else can understand it. And it's not just you who understands yep. your madness. So yeah, um, it's definitely paid off being organized and that's not one of my strong suits. And I copied this uh, folder naming and all that from someone else, but yep. it's something that's really held up and, and worked well over time. Awesome. Yeah, it really, and it's important for if you, you know, had another editor coming in and working in that same Photoshop file, or if you, you know, scaled and had a team like, 
I always try to think about that too with my files. Like if I end, ever end up taking this project and giving it over to an editor, like are they going to be able to encode or like encrypt what I'm <laughs> trying to say here or is it going to be easy for them to follow? Totally. And yeah, that's really important too. It's like if you know the method to your madness with file naming or lack thereof, that's one thing. But yeah, sometimes you pass these off to <clears throat> clients or agencies and you got to make sure that they can understand it too. Absolutely. Well, uh, Justin, I think we're uh, out of time and uh, I could sit here all day and watch you edit and talk shop. And uh, I'd like to do that offline. Um, but, you know, thank you for being here in this Adobe Live format. Um, I had a blast and I know everyone in the chat was uh, super stoked to, to see what you've been working on. Yeah, well, thanks so much everyone for joining. This is great. Yeah, and uh, thank you to those who have uh, been watching today. Again, for those in the chat, a uh, couple housekeeping items. If you'd like to stick around and continue your journey on uh, Behance today, uh, make sure to uh, stick around for the daily creative challenge uh, with Andrew Hokerdell, immediately followed by logo design with Daniel Labonte. Uh, and again, my name is James Bonanno. I was your host for the last two days. And uh, Justin, thanks, man. Appreciate it. And uh, good luck in your future endeavors. I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk. Thank you. Appreciate right, it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Take care, everyone.